Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host Agostino Zynga and this episode number 478, that's 478 of the Agostino Zynga Show, how you doing, how you feeling, great, amazing, good to know, if you're watching this via YouTube, please do not adjust your set or your screen or your controller or your phone, wherever you may be, yes I know I'm half naked but please um, do not run and call the police, I promise you that I'm only into women now of, of age, <laughs> but it is entirely um, what you call it, appropriate for the weather that we have here at the moment it's absolutely scorching here in London and in most parts of the UK so unfortunately I'm having to wear a Primark singlet in order to make sure that my body breathes nice and tight but of course if you look really really close you'll see there's loads of perspiration still trickling down my forehead so the vest isn't working as I thought it would but you know we go, we go, we go. Of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will help the show to spread and go a long way. You can also support the show via Patreon. We've got bonus episodes uploading on there every Saturday. One on there from last week, one coming this weekend. So get involved for as little as $1 per month. You get access to that entire library of stuff. And of course, if you're watching via YouTube, smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. Love to know your thoughts, feelings and suggestions regarding all the topics I'm going to talk about right now. So here we are, man. A um, couple of days until the weekend starts and the first round of proper parties happens. I think a lot of people were waiting for what? Oh no, a lot of people obviously waited for Monday, Sunday, Monday ish kind of time when obviously the uh, formal announcement was made and people made their first kind of rounds around the town and whatnot. But the real party heads are definitely going to go out this weekend. So definitely give you a more of a accurate um, representation of what the scene is like. I still have my reservations. I'm still of the thinking that a lot of people are underestimating the. Um, what kind of tourism contributed to the club scene here in london especially and also just general punters i think a lot of people like to criticize your everyday normie sort of club goer but i think they definitely add to the numbers in terms of people on the dance floor i think you can't survive with just club kids alone you're going to need regular people who just you know want to let their hair down coming to your events as well and i think those people have probably moved on to other things they've probably taken up hobbies right they've probably decided to start making you know sourdough bread start knitting they maybe finally they finally decided to um, open up that restaurant they've been thinking about all this time or they've moved away out in, out of the city into the country there's a lot of things that have changed throughout these past 16 months. So I think people's idea that somehow every club's going to be ram jammed is fairly um, um, unsubst uns unsubstantiated. I think that's a term, right? Um, by the numbers and by just generally what I'm seeing around. I've saw some clips. I saw some Instagram stories of people attending events the last over the last week, and it hasn't kind of you know gonna miss from the stuff that i've seen that places look kind of empty they're not obviously you know super empty but they're not as um shoulder to shoulder pressure that you would have expected from these venues right and um, the only thing that i saw that was fairly full was obviously the party adonis which is mostly catered towards the gay scene and um, that makes a lot more sense because you would imagine, you know, if you are from that sort of community, you're going to want to prioritize going out to clubs or going out to venues where they are more um, welcoming of people that live the lifestyle that you live. You're not going to waste your time going to clubs that, you know, you're definitely not going to have. Can you hear that in the background? The cars, I hope you can't. But anyway, it's too, it's too hot. I'm not going to close the window. I can't. You're obviously not going to... Um, try and you know spend your weekend going to clubs that generally aren't going to cater to your needs so that makes sense if those kind of clubs are going to be or those kind of club are going to be a little bit more jam-packed but i think the regular smuggler ones i think places like oval places like xoyo places like e1 places like fabric are going to be in for a big surprise once they open i think people are going to really um see what the scene is like when you take away tourism and when you take away regular normie customers but i hope i'm wrong because a lot of these places are places that are near and dear to my heart and i want them to survive i want them to be able to kind of you know uh, put on these nights be able to give local up-and-coming people an opportunity to make a name for themselves build a career that's what i'm hoping will happen but you know things can get a bit weird out there but let's see man let's see weekends approaching um hopefully things change for the better 
one of the more interesting parts of this development especially with the clubs opening is this new um, initiative or mandate that's going to be put forth in September that Boris Johnson announced on Monday very sneakily um, so far when it comes to changing policies regarding the reopening of society most of the British government's approach has been to basically leak some of the information ahead of time to kind of gauge the public sentiment and then over the period of a couple of days they gauge the backlash or whatnot or criticism and then change their approach and then by the time it gets put into law it's already been changed to fit into what everyone's needs are but with this particular st um, state or this particular thing that they wanted to do in terms of vaccine passports for crowded venues they didn't really leak the information it was the one approach one policy they had they kept close to their chest and obviously there's a reason why they didn't want the backlash they didn't want to deal with the public scrutiny and they went to just kind of sweep it under the rug and quickly move on which they effectively have but i'm really surprised by the um I'm really surprised by how quickly the clubs and promoters across the country have accepted these new measures and have kind of acquiesced. And I guess it's no surprise, really, because, you know, they spent 16 months without being able to earn an income, without being able to put on events for their local community, without being able to put, have a platform to kind of allow artists to basically perform. So whatever needs to be done to ensure that their doors are kept open, they're going to do it within reason. So it's no surprise that they would do it, but I'm just surprised that there was no pushback initially to kind of be like, hey, we don't want to discriminate from our punters already, right? There's already a feeling that some club nights or some places are a bit discriminatory about certain people. You know, there's certain venues you can't go to with large group of boys, especially cis, you know, white males kind of thing, get sort of scrutinized a little bit more in the club scene, especially in the more underground type spaces, which is understandable too, because you want to provide a safe space for the people that go there week in week out and not just a fly by night heads but still if you want to create a space that's non-discriminatory i think discriminating on people based on their vaccine status is sometimes a little bit too far but i've seen some places doing it the right way basically saying that how we're not going to check your passport we just want to make sure you're negative so take a test before you come ahead which is more than fair in it but this is some of the general approaches that i've been seeing this is courtesy of origins one of our kind of standout club nights here in the uk i've attended a few of their raves at mixed garage r.i.p and they said the following dear origins family conditions of entry please do not attend um, our events if you feel unwell or have any covid related symptoms it will be mandatory requirement of entry to provide either a negative lateral flow test or a negative PCR test before our parties until further notice if you can't provide this you will not be allowed entry tests will need to be done 48 hours before an event which is more than okay right if you can if you don't want to get a um a vaccine or whatever it may be or you don't want to get a PS2 test which is super expensive lateral flow tests will be more than enough because they're free as well via the government anyone anyone who can provide proof of positive tests will be able to submit a refund that's funny too right you have to if your test positive you have to give them proof to get a refund and if you're negative you have to give them proof in order to get in um, you will be submit a refund request via Fatsoma RA or carry the ticket to a further date um, future that so you can head to most local pharmacies and pick up a lateral flow test or all of them for free from the government they are readily available so please be responsible and get tested please follow the link below if you require further information so it's all there this is to ensure the safety of others and to help prevent the spread of the virus and to help dancers and staff who are entering our venues and feel safe and possible and that's something a lot of people are basically overlooking we're all going to these places like myself as a dj and as a punter a customer i'm going to just enjoy right i'm not really i don't really have much skin in the game i'm obviously going there as a sort of a contractor per se you come in come out and obviously as a customer you come in and come out you don't really have any skin in the game you're not invested in any of the infrastructure blah 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 blah, blah. but i'd imagine a lot of these places are probably struggling to get staff right i've seen many um vacancies for people to go to work at Cors corsica studios to work at village underground um, fabric for a bit was hiring people so they're obviously struggling to get staff in um for various amounts of reasons who knows maybe because most of the staff was made out of immigrants who have basically moved back home since covid i'm not really sure but regardless whatever staff they do have available will want to be make sure that they feel safe and they feel like they're in an environment where people are taking all the necessary precautions within reason to make sure that they're not you know at risk of getting the virus because the last thing you want is to spend all this time not being employed not being able to make any money then suddenly the place is reopened you can make some money but then you're also putting your life at risk 
you know what I mean? Because people aren't necessarily taking the necessary precautions to make sure it's a safe space. So I definitely understand that regard. It continues says, if you feel safer with a mask on, please feel comfortable to bring it, wearing this at any time during a dance. Funny, in it, that you could actually wear a full face mask when you go to a club. Before, that was a kind of a no-no. I'm assuming if you want to show your ID, you probably have to take it off just to show them your face and stuff. But you can get away with wearing a full face mask covering your entirety of your face, apart from your eyes for the pro you know for the duration of the event that you go to even if it's not like a sex positive event or a really kind of dark dingy techno one you could just wear a face mask full time and no one's going to really bat an eyelid remember that we operate as a safe space respecting all others and dance law it's not long now let's remember to look after ourselves and each other so that was from origins and then another place also said the same thing world unknown another decent club night here that we have in london they said the following regarding the vaccine passports. What's their statements here? Uh, yeah, there we go. This is, um, we won't be insisting that you show proof of your test, vaccine or antibody status, but it's really easy and free to take lateral flow test. We're available for free at Chemist and some other places to go get a few boxes so you can test when you're going out to places where lots of other people will be. It's a good habit to get into for the foreseeable future. And of course, please don't come if you're feeling ill in any way. If you have a missed a party because of COVID, get in touch and we can move your ticket to a further date. So everyone's being fair flexible but there is this understanding that more than likely because the government has treated nightlife and club culture as an afterthought if they want to push forward with this vaccine passport they're going to do it they're not going to really listen to any sort of op, you know um uh, challenges or opposition right they're not they're just going to put it into place so if that's the case they better try and their best the best use of their time and efforts as a club is to make sure they get their customers acquainted with the processes and the procedures needed to gain entry and then you can fight that fight another time but for now just to make sure the places stay open they stay open but again i'm just surprised that there hasn't been a little bit more pushback like hey man this is ridiculous it's unconstitutional we're discriminating against our punters but again missing out on 16 plus months of income and of party creation it can make you kind of be like you know what let's do away with this stuff and just move forward um one last thing when we finish at 11 each night there's a night party starting pretty much straight away there's a sold out everywhere but yeah so let's see what happens and then i think lastly crossbreed also had an announcement regarding the vaccine it says uh please come uh, uh please only come if you don't if you've done a lateral test regardless of your job status we will not be policing it we trust our community to do the right thing so that's a really good way to go about it you know we're not going to check it out the door we're not going to make it a, a standard requirement to get in, which is going to be by law in September. It'd be nice to see some places push back, but, you know, they're trying to get everybody into the good habits of making sure they do it. So, again, fully understandable. I get it. It's annoying for myself and customers alike who kind of don't want to be put in a position where you're having to show your medical information or your vaccine status in order to gain entry into a nightclub. It just goes against everything about what club culture is meant to be. But again, again, no skin in the game. I don't know what goes into operating these places. There's a lot on the line. If this is what's needed in order to get these places back up and running, so be it. So be it. And then RA here has a list of events happening in the UK all around. Um, obviously, like I said, the key date, they said it's the 19th, but most of the big events are happening this weekend. In London, we have um, the following. said so after 16 months in the dark, Ford reopens this weekend with three parties in as many days, so back to back to back. Um, the pick has, has to be the 18 hour event with Dax J and more running from Friday to Saturday and then they've got another event from Saturday to Sunday and then they've got the Unfold which is usually like a resident night from the Sunday onwards and I like what they're doing with Unfold from Fold they're basically saying they're not going to announce the lineups it's just going to be like a residence celebration sort of thing which is a great way to sort of uh, market that event and a lot of people have a lot of good things to say about it especially now working from home there's an ability to go down the Sunday and get a little bit sloshed and it not be such an issue that's good going forward then after a forced Start in 2020. Oh yeah, true. They got this new venue called um, uh, Space 289. It's going to reopen throughout the summer, hosting OK Williams and Thea, um, Sylvia Castell, Space Africa, and more. I think this is like a small event space in Bethnal Green, which is Eastish London. It's about 300 people capacity, so the perfect amount of people I think for most clubs in London. That I think the most mon the most kind of influential and fun places to go to are usually the ones that are like 500 cap i feel like they work really well especially when you consider the set times in london are usually shorter than where they may be in mainland europe people don't really play for more than two hours i don't know why it's just a thing that we do here um and if that's the case having a 300 capacity 500 capacity venue is perfect for that sort of um lineup of djs it's wham bam over your head um good, good again good location good um transport links and all that malarkey so that works then it says granny studio 338 has another one 
has a, a lot of plan coming months including shows with brunch electric electronic i don't know who that is dj like mc neat of course garage legends Graham originals cocoon and browsing listings here stoke new basement place the waiting room also reopens on friday july 23rd and for uh, highlights in july and august include broken english club da disco and sc and p plus a weekly residency of disco halal boss man moscow man oof that's going to be a big one too so good stuff to see this weekend definitely keep an eye out if you're in london for the events and whatnot because they're going to be absolutely popping all weekend long what else do we have here bah, 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 bah. yeah we have this article here courtesy of the new york times um obviously uh, marked mandates have been reintroduced in la so you know unfortunately they're going back into the dark ages you know brenda Shawboy says what well, kevin newsom's basically running la like north korea which is insane comparison but you know he's an insane guy but for all the people who are just about getting back to life as normal now the mask mandate has been, re been reintroduced without the restrictions in terms of industries being open that's fairly cool but it must be a bit of a kick in the teeth in it especially imagine the heat that they're under in la to go back to wearing masks full time everywhere it must be so annoying so it's cut to a new york times that says weary and no weary and weary los angeles largely accepts restored mask mandate santa monica california as the sun began to burn through uh the morning marine layer patrons of the third street promenade in santa monica california were still being adjusting to the new normal which was pretty much the old normal in order from the los angeles county to wear masks indoors in prisons and public spaces most customers dutifully took their mask on and off in the interest of shop where signs were posted to remind them to police of the policy where in some cases complimentary masks were ordered or were offered out of state tourists found themselves wearing masks for the first time in months sometimes annoyed by largely um complying and one restaurant employee who forgot about the mandate was able to secure a mask by running across the street and asking employees of stargaze if they had extra well you are alive to live in it this new reality is fucking sucks man this virus is just so annoying in it you get the vaccine you're still susceptible to get it you don't get it people scream at you you wear a mask people look at you like a freak in some places you don't wear it people tell you to run across the street to get one Ay, ay, ay. some people think it's punishment the quote says here said lisa liu 38 who said that she was fully vaccinated she was stopping no shopping on saturday or sunday and interviewed outside a clothing store called tazga but for me it's a mask it's not a big deal she had an interviewed oh so it was interviewed for the section of her first she had an interview outside the shop um it was not what people expected when the previous mandate was lifted a month ago but for the most part people in los angeles seem to react to the re reassigned acceptance sorry with the resigned acceptance sometimes even worry approval figuring that the rise of covid19 rates made the policy tolerable if not welcome so i guess most people have understood that the numbers are just insane it doesn't matter i guess this this variant has fucking kicked everyone's ass and everyone's got stories of friends and families who have been double jabbed and still got the still got the virus um they don't want to go to a place where their kids are having to do zoom classes so if they have to give up the ability to not wear a mask indoors then so be it if they can just go back to some semblance of normality which is understandable but this just shows how much we've been beaten into submission in it um the decision was greeted with cautious um greeted cautiously by some store and restaurant employees wary of going back to having to enforce the policies with mass restricted customers still some seem prepared to do it yeah true isn't it? this is going to be good for people that are fans again if you haven't tuned in then please do there's a subreddit called public freakout that i'm always on 24 7 it's one of my favorite places to go on the internet and this basically tells us that public freakout is going to have a resurgence within the next couple of weeks we're definitely going to see some great karen and ken or whatever they is it ken is the male karen whether the male karen is videos of people freaking out in shops because they have to put a mask on for two minutes before they buy some avocados i can't wait it continues anna it 250 said that her bosses at local retail store had instructed her to ask customers to put the mask on when they entered but she wasn't allowed to insist that they do still she described one confrontation in which she was asked by a customer to leave the store she says i don't play games with that i'm that person that will tell them you don't need you shouldn't do that anna man you're 50 years old working in retail the last thing you should be doing is getting in to confrontations with people in the shop i wouldn't even i guess by law or it depends if your managers are watching you at the flip in front of the store you kind of have to say these things but i would gently suggest it but i wouldn't be like you know 
oppressing these people and step into them in any way, shape or form. Because if there's one thing that we've learned over the last few months is that the people who don't want to wear a mask really don't like wearing them. For them, it feels like, you know, the Yar word. If somebody tries to make them wear a mask, they have no ability to understand that it's a short term inconvenience for a long term gain because effectively you get to do what you want to do by just putting on a bit of cloth on your face for a couple of minutes and you dip. And if you really have strong opposition to it, you're more than welcome to take a business elsewhere. It's not that big of an issue. But the one thing you're not going to do is convince them that they're wrong. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't even want to play those games. There's not there's not a retail job that's worth it. I'll make that that'll make sense to get in a confrontation with somebody and end up on some Reddit and have me laughing at you. It says the indoor mask mandate for all people, regardless of vaccination status, took effect at midnight on Saturday, making Los Angeles County the first major county in the United States to reinstate social requirement. The policy expands beyond the current state standard and recommendation by the Center of Disease Control. Uh, da, 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 both require masks for unvaccinated people, but not for those who are fully vaccinated. Coronavirus cases count has risen sharply under the less stringent guidelines, especially as the high transmissible Delta variant continues to spread. The county's daily average of new cases has more than doubled in each of the past two weeks, reaching an almost 1,400 as of Saturday. And COVID-19 hospitalizations are up 27%, even though more people are getting vaccinated. Mad in it. So they made a big deal about everyone getting jabbed. Now that now we're seeing that jabs are not as important as we thought they were. So why can't they just this is the thing I don't understand. Why can't especially now with all this information that we have, why can't you just let the people that don't want to get jabbed or have a mask to leave them on their own, leave them to their own devices? Because for the most part, the vaccine doesn't prevent you getting it, but it does kind of reduce your your risk of dying, which is fair enough. That's the most that's the most amount of protection that you want to be protected from, right? But I don't know, man. This constant war that we're having between the believers and non-believers, such a waste of time and resources. Let them just live their lives and we can live ours, isn't it? Um, still, the numbers are far, sm far smaller than during the country's uh, county, sorry, winter peak and daily deaths have remained a single digits. The quote says here, when you look back at the last seven days, obviously a whole, a whole, a whole heap has changed, said Hilda Solis, the chair of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Uh, said on ABC this week, Miss Solis called an increase on COVID cases very disturbing. And if that wasn't more disturbing, then we've got this story here, courtesy of the Los Angeles Times, says Hollywood crews could be forced to vaccinate under new deal with unions, which again, makes sense and is a really big u-turn considering that there was a time if i'm not mistaken where for some reason hollywood studios were allowed to film stuff but then people couldn't open their businesses right there was that one famous video of that woman that was crying because her restaurant had been told to shut down even though she put all the stuff needed to do outdoor dining but then right next door there was a film studio setup thing with um catering and all the outside pretty much of a piss take in it so Los Angeles Times says the following Hollywood workers may have to be vaccinated to work on union film sets under the COVID-19 safety precautions. The requirement, sorry, producers will have the option to mandate vaccinations for their cast and crew working in close proximity to actors leading entertainment industry unions and alliance of Hollywood producers said on Monday. The measures is one of the several protocols that are being updated along with the relaxed testing and masking requirements and a new agreement that will run until September 30th, according to the joint statement signed by multiple unions. The short-term deal will with SAG, obviously, that's the group, that's the gov that's the body, right? The union and AFTRA, the International Alliance of Fe Theatrical Stage Employees and other unions is, uh, eases some of the safety protocols put in place last fall that provided for sick pay, um, testing, masking and other safety intended measures to prevent the spread of virus. After the agreement lapsed in June 30th, the groups began negotiating ways to loosen the restrictions to facilitate food production. The new measures were expected to reduce testing and sanitation requirements harming others to lower costs for producers so big big changes happening in la for most people that's a good thing it's not like it's affecting just a small sliver of the population everyone seems to be affected by it there's none of that you know one rule for us one rule for you sort of thing um that's really great to see but it's going to be tough to see how they're going to roll this out properly man it's going to be flipping tough to see how they're going to roll this one out properly so uh, 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 let's see, let's move on. What else do we have? 
bish bash bosh oh yeah we got this article this is courtesy of hypebeast it says clubhouse enables text-based dm feature clubbase uh clubhouse clubbase clubhouse is not stopping they're trying their best to make the best of a worse situation you know there was that time when they were you know incorrectly in my opinion i made a podcast about it when they were valued at something like four billion dollars or something stupid when they're at their peak and people were on the app every single day and they were the hot shit in the startup scene when i decided to sign up and use it for myself after being lucky enough to be granted permission to use it because i had people that i knew who were part of the app already who kind of approved my application behind the scenes i had no idea that it was an invitation only sort of thing which kind of would have put me off if i knew that beforehand but once i had a little play around i quickly realized that this isn't going to have any legs past the pandemic it kind of only really popped up in my opinion because of the times that we were all locked indoors with nothing much to do kind of bored of watching stuff on netflix run out of stuff to watch on youtube and, you know, now having this kind of audio only um, social media platform was quite novel, right? Quite new, quite interesting. And if there's one thing about novel, interesting things, they usually have a short shelf life. And after a long and protected period, after a quite long and somewhat short protected period of time, people kind of jumped off it. Other apps basically copied the feature. Spotify have got their own thing with Green Room. Um, Twitter have their one with Spaces. Facebook have a version two that I think Joe Biden was one of the first people to sign up on. So there's obviously the feature was obviously easily copied and now they're kind of you know unique selling point is kind of gone and people are kind of going in other places and platforms that they already use day to day they're now pivoting and trying to add new features in order to kind of keep it somewhat relevant so um, this text-based dm system is the following it says clubhouse will let users have one-on-one -on -one or group chat via direct messages this is explosive group this will be the so explosive growth so this will be the first time the social audio app will bring on a text-based communication system or ios and android users interesting they've got android now because at the start it was only ios and they were quite snobby about it same with the invite only now no one's using it they invite, they're opening it to android users and they're adding a text-based um, messaging system behind it it's just funny um the, the users can now use a back end sorry the back channel messaging feature for sending text and links no images or video are supported in this system yet the function will help users connect within the invite only app without any third party apps or social media platforms Platforms as well as other moderators that are there you can simply press the airplane icon to start a conversation we don't need to follow the messages to non -plat to non followers it will go to the optional inbox that houses all your messaging requests thinking about it now how long before clubhouse just becomes like a version of like anchor how long before they just have an app that you could use on your desktop computer or laptop or stuff it feels like it's going to go that direction and it? it feels like it will just turn into like an all-inclusive um kind of you know live podcasting audio sort of platform that feels like the way they're going to end up going especially if they want to ensure people are using the app but it is a clever way to ensure that you kind of cook the numbers because i'm assuming if you want to go public you're going to have to have the numbers that basically prove that people are spending an exorbitant amount of time on the app and unfortunately because there's no um you know on demand kind of replay sort of option you have to you know you have to be kind of tuned in live it limits the amount of time people spend on it but then if you're allowing people to message people or mods or you know host whatever it may be on the app itself it prevents them from jumping onto facebook or instagram dms to do so so it increases you know people's time on the app and any increase whether it's spread even if it's spread across 100 people you know a couple of minutes here and there is going to add up in the end to your overall numbers when you're sending your um, investment deck over to the companies or whatnot i'd assume we can quick uh, should we play over this yes play it's not gonna play the sound is it let's play new feature alert it's just a little image, a little graphic visualization that's showing us how it basically looks and works fairly straightforward with the little bubbles yeah let me see da, 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 da. yeah it's fairly straightforward it probably will end up being quite beneficial for them i think and it's probably is a feature that a lot of people that use it still have basically called out for it does make some sense you know you don't want people jumping on whatsapp and instagram dms in order to get people's attention for certain things and if they're on the app itself you want them to spend as much time on there as possible you want them to have pop-up notifications on and all that good stuff so it's great to see but again i i do see um 
now with 100 more DMs, I do see a future where they end up just going to a fully desktop platform. They end up turning it into basically its own version of like a Skype minus the video chats and whatnot. I definitely see that happening in a foreseeable future. But if you're still in Clubhouse now, then I'm going to pray for you regardless. <laughs> Then we have this story, courtesy of Hypers again. Weird one because this is just a standard one. I think more so. I'm not sure if it's a London Pacific thing, but in London, for the most part, our kind of Eastern European, Central European community of people, they tend to have a bit of a soft spot for um, what they called for Nike to Air 270s, right? Is that what they are? The bubbles that goes around the wraps around the back. They have a big, I don't know why, for some reason, they seem to love that shoe. It seems to maybe go really well with the tracksuits they wear, blah, 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 blah. So now Nike have introduced this one. It's called a Nike Air Max 2021, which looks like an update on the 270, maybe the Air Apparent. And it kind of speaks, I think, to what those guys like to wear. I can definitely envisage a lot of the Romanian you know eastern european guys ukrainian whatever they're from wearing these shoes because the bubble the sleek silhouette the kind of exaggerated midsole that kind of adds you or some you know unrequented height that you much needed especially in a tight tracksuit it looks fairly good and you can just imagine the amount of color makeups they're going to be able to put in these going forward so for sure these are going to be very very popular when they end up coming out the text itself says continuing to add to a story air max lineup nike is now set to introduce an air 21 um their 2020 sorry at 2021 the upcoming model builds on a legacy of the footwear line with sustainable construction that utilizes at least 20 percent recyclable materials which is 20 percent recycled not that they're 20 percent recyclable it would be interesting to know because can you recycle my shoes once they've been recycled already that materials because i'm assuming the materials have been added to right the base of it is recycled but maybe the finished product has been twanged some bit and also we don't know how much material we don't know how much percentage of recycled material each shoe has that might mean you know the pattern itself for a number of shoes is 20 percent, but how much does that actually go into each shoe probably less than one percent i'd imagine but anyway the debuting in the ghost ashen slate obscene the mist colorway the mx 21 2021 features a futuristic synthetic and mesh upper marked with a textured finish distinct elements come in the form of a padded collars and overbuilt tongue portions that ascent the lacing system alleviate so elevating the shoe are called out foam midsoles assisted by the bulbous transparent colored air units paired with rubber outsoles price 160 dollars which i'm assuming is going to be like a between between what 120 130 110 130 the mx 2021 is now set to debut uh and come out on august the 5th so yeah i'm assuming these are going to be very popular man these look like they're going to be extremely popular next on the list we have some interesting and great news if you're mr virgil ablo and if you're also one of the hangers on that happens to kind of hang around him and wants to gain opportunities within the fashion scene Virgil Abloh has a seat at the LVMH, LVMH power table the luxury group has bought a majority stake in Off-White and given his founder a license to shake up more than just fashion and he's got skin in the game so really great news overall in terms of representation in terms of inclusivity in terms of diversity in hiring and it's not even a black thing it's more so just a non whatever the fashion scene is at the moment it's just you know unfortunately um, there it's probably one of the most the, um, slow moving industries it feels like they don't really respond well to what's happening in society it seems to just do their own thing and for the most part customers don't seem to care and it just seems to keep trudging on you think about all the controversy that happened with you know Dolce Gabbana in China they obviously got cancelled quote unquote for a brief period of time but they just continued as per normal LV, you know, Vogue Runway still features them brands are still or magazines are still pulling their pieces and featuring them in editorials things don't really change quickly in fashion they change slowly or they change because they're monetarily viable it becomes a commercially um, proficient way to approach business right and that's why they tend to do it so it's less about they give a shit about Black Lives Matter and more so that they're just doing it because it seems like a beneficial thing to do both in a cultural point of view you know making sure that they got the great engagement they're in all the right places and also making sure that they're selling the product because that's what in the business of doing so the articles are the following Virgil the fashion designer DJ and pundit of pop culture what's a pundit of pop culture should I stop calling myself that I started relating to myself as a cultural commentator but maybe I should say pundit of culture in it um, is about to become the most powerful black executive at the most powerful luxury goods group in the world this is why I say this sentence here is why a lot of people should maybe um, as much as they don't like the guy put that to one side and just think that this is a 
net benefit overall going forward because think about all the amazing creative talented fresh and creatives and individuals that have come before Virgil who never got this opportunity before it was never even mentioned right and now he's the first or he's, he's one of the only you know people of that level doing the thing that he's doing that looks the way that he looks right it's insane to think that so it does go to prove that these companies these conglomerates don't really give a shit really about blm they're just doing it because he seems to fit he's the right person to do it at this time he seems to have the culture in the middle of his hands and he seems to get it and he seems to sell product that's essentially why they're doing it no other reason but again it's good because regardless he still seems like a person that's going to be quite selfless he's going to leave the, do the door slightly ajar for whoever's coming behind him and they're going to come through and hopefully take the opportunities and chances regardless if it's given you know because of quote-unquote affirmative action at this point it doesn't really matter it's just necessary to have a bit of a shake up different voices in the room just so we can as customers even just as pure people that just want to view the finished product in the magazine on a video stream can get something far more interesting right less of the same old same old something to shake up and make it a little bit more interesting because at the moment it was feeling a little bit stale and there's one thing that you can't say about Virgil and his work is that it's not stale it's always an event it's always a moment it's always a moment it's like I have to think of it as well maybe throughout the entirety of his time doing stuff he might be one of the only people show that I've actually watched on live stream and not because you know I'm watching him because I want to see amazing clothes but just because of the overall production the event the the spectacle of it all right that's what really makes what he does really really interesting i feel like and if even everybody associated with it you look at stuff that heron preston does matthew william does it's all you know kind of driven from a really real cultural um essence as opposed to just doing stuff in terms of making nice clothes it continues on tuesday of the animation announced it was acquiring a 60 percent stake in off-white the luxury streetwear brand abloh founded in 2013 and which he still designs alongside his job at twisted director louis vuitton men's 2013 do you remember when that first launched that was a what was the first lookbook that was with asap rocky and them right so imagine that brand that we saw that used to make you know those rugby shirts with the numbers on the back and shit that every, he got remember that was give the guy credit as well right he's been really good at kind of changing the way he's been perceived in public or changing how he's approached criticism because there was a period of time where he was trying to lean into the troll thing with bin troll i'm a troll i'm a troll i'm a troll and then with the rugby shirts buying them for 20 dollars and then selling them for 600 bucks and being unashamed about the flagrancy of it all right but then he slowly pivoted away from that and then turned into more of a i'm for the community i'm for the people i'm doing it for everyone coming behind me don't call me a designer he did a really good way of kind of changing the narrative around him somewhat because again I, I think deep down regardless of maybe some of the stuff that people have heard i think he's not a bad dude so i don't think he could have done that kind of i'm gonna be a hill i'm gonna be um the what you call it who's that what's what's his name again i'm gonna be the what's his name what's his flipping name the guy that does the white guy does all the horrible diamond teeth stuff he can't be that kind of bad character he needs to just be himself and this is a good um you know recognition of the work that he's done bro to be in this position is mad in addition ablo 40 will be taking on bigger role fmh working across such categories as wine and spirits awesome hospitality which makes sense because i think he mentions he wants to do something with the hotel and smashing styles and bringing more diverse voices a variety of brands that's interesting because the hotel thing if i remember he didn't mention he was going to do it so and it went quiet so maybe this is something that's been in the discussions for a while and then he kind of put the hotel stuff to bed so that he could do it under the banner of lvmh because that's you know hella more swaggy that you do it like that than do it on your own he says i'm getting a seat at the table miss ablo said cheerfully speaking for a zoom via chicago where he lives how he still lives in chicago is beyond me isn't it mad isn't it he hasn't moved at all didn't really make any effort to move kind of it's pretty cool but in terms of considering off-white space in milan louis vuitton's obviously in paris it's mad, isn't it? Though his job definition is still fairly nebulous, the news gives him a sablo, the first generation guy named American, a fairly broad remit and makes off white one of the rare brands ever made stable, not rooted in European heritage. Um, it also marks a potential new stage in evolution, which has emerged from the pandemic. The share has gone up 60% this year, blah, blah, blah. Um, it says here the we're trying to emulate the model that already exists. No, we're not trying to emulate the model that already exists, says Mike, Michael Burke, chief executive of Louis Vuitton. It's more like what Bernard Arnault did when he bought Dior and decided to create a 
Federation of Luxury Brands that is shake up the status quo. He's sucking off his boss there a bit, but I get what he means. Now Mr. Arno is trying to kick his own organizations out of his comfort zone with Diablo as the zeitgeist whisperer. Definitely makes sense. The news arrange the news arrangement is akin to the collaboration Mr. Diablo specializes in with IKEA, Nike's champion, Vitro Equinox to name a few, but pumped up on a protein drink with long term implications. Diablo isn't just getting a cool new sounding gig, he is getting an equity stake in whatever cross pollinated project he develops. Bumba rotted. Cash cash money, mate. So it's pulling a salary from LVMH, pulling a salary from all the collaborations, pulling a salary from Nike, and then pulling a salary on top of that with this um, LVMH seat at the table news is absolutely wild, bruv. Kicked up to the max, but also it gives him some skin in the game, right? It gives him a reason to go extra hard. And if there's one thing that we can say about the guy, he might not like the quality of his work, but there's no denying that he is number one Uno, the, the hardest working man out there in fashion. It has to be. And I would imagine LVMH jumped on him because since the passing of Carla, there hasn't been really anybody that can take that mantle of just doing everything um you know just being willing to do whatever and then of course if you know whatever holding company that owns you or that's invested the money in you is super happy because even if some project ends up failing because you've just got such a high output you're you're bound to um you're bound to catch thunder in a, or you're bound to catch thunder in a bottle at one moment in time and that's what he's been able to do over these years so he's definitely built a good cv of just you know doing many many projects at lightning break speed and so far for the most part they've all been into very very successful he says yeah we're trying to make the founders turn over their graves but in the best way said mr burke that's not going to sit well with some fashion um aficionado just said or purist sorry he says it continues some of our biggest brands have the tendency not not to see it's it's in their best interest to stay plugged into the contemporary world very true being plugged into contemporary world has not been a problem for miss abloh who's often compared to jeff coons didn't they compare him to carl lagerford this actual writer why is she saying jeff coons i might wonder this because of the backlash um refers to himself as a maker rather than a designer and touts a three percent approach which holds that changing just three percent of the design is enough to qualify for as new some of his detractors will probably won't be happy about that we can move we move lvmh has been vocal about the commitment to diversity equity and Inclusion. Yeah, right. There is entirely whiteboard and equity community. <laughs> exactly. Um, it did not help the LVMH put Fenty, the short lived experiment of, of building a direct to consumer brand from scratch with Rihanna on hold last year, though the company remains involved with Rihanna for a cosmetic brand. I just think that was just not done well. It probably, you know, after the first season or the first lookbook, the quality of Fenty stuff went a bit downhill. Rihanna's got a million in one project she's probably doing from behind the scenes. And it's pretty hard to make a direct to consumer brand from the ground up that people are going to care about. It's just just difficult to do it's not easy so i don't think this was a necessarily a uh, a kind of spite or kind of you know a, a response to the lack of diversity and inclusion i think in general it's just like i said it should be concerning to most people that after all these years of great black in you know fashion creative people that have worked in the industry for this to be the first major hire and the first kind of person of color that's been able to have a seat on the table is a bit concerning but again regardless i think this is the perfect person to put there the new arrangement with Ablo and Miss of of white is part of a flurry of activity on part of LVMH it bought Tiffany last year last week it announced that it was taking minority stake in Phoebe Fowler's namesake venture and last month it renovated and opened a department store and later this year the ultra luxury Cheval Blanc Hotel and Dior Spa will open in Paris you got Spike Lee there wearing an uh, is that an off-white design suit or is it a Louis Vuitton suit Louis Vuitton suit to the Cannes Film Festival in fluorescent pink those colours always look good on black skin in it looks banging the deal also positions off-white which is most famous for his ironic deployment of quotation marks for Ablo terms generational growth the off why the contemporary brand is still operated by new guards so i was wondering so it's still operated by new guards group the italian manufacturing company that owns the license for the brand and itself is owned by farfetched off-white lcc which owns a trademark will be incorporated into the lvmh fashion and leather goods group in terms of the deal were not disclosed though mr burke said it took five minutes to come to an agreement they backed up the don't don't get me wrong they said they're gonna say that but they backed up the brinks truck for virgil for sure so it's owned by new guards group still manufacturing who then is under far-fetched but then off-white lcc which is separate from that 
is owned by LVMH. I don't know how he's done it, but fair enough to the guy, in it. Fair still. He's going to get the bag. He's going to get the opportunity to influence things at the highest level. And again, that's going to serve as inspiration and direction for people coming up for generations to come. And I think that's all you can really hope for. I think, you know, nothing, I don't think that there needs to be some compromise because at the end of the day, these companies at LVMH are not going to do these sort of things out of charity, right? They're only doing it because it's a financially viable solution and they're only doing it again because Virgil's really good at what he does so that's another reason so the fact that he does it and some people are not fans of his work is by the by I think in general from what we've seen evidence so far he's been able to provide opportunities and and platforms for various people some of them undeserving and they've been able to build entire careers off the back of that so if he can have a bigger platform and more resources to do so within the fashion system to tell better stories um, to influence a whole generation of people I'm sure he's going to do it because if anything selfishly it just makes his legacy and his time on the scene that much more sweet and that much more impactful so I definitely think it's going to be a good thing for all parties involved so for sure if you're looking to do something in that space you probably is best to kind of you know get a move on get on it because for sure there's going to be many opportunities going forward for sure because you know streetwear has definitely made a mark now man it's definitely made a mark next on list we have this news courtesy of teddy santis the now creative director of new balance usa and also the founder of amelion amelion dior how do you pronounce that name amelion dior however you pronounce it is that how you pronounce it i'm not too sure but regardless he has now um leaked images of a new model called the new balance 65r which is obviously a high top version of the 250 or whatever that model is that prior 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 um it looks like he's going back into the archives and trying to resurrect models that aren't necessarily the most um popular within the current new balance fan base um which is a good thing to do because it obviously gives you a chance to kind of frame your own story and also kind of add to your own legacy but the only thing i would say is that this shape has been in my opinion a little bit exhausted ever since new balance decided to put it as a gr after the um, million years kind of collaboration it feels like i've seen this shape everywhere and now that all the sneaker customizers and whatever they are whoever those guys are that do those shoes and copy their or resisting shape they've now decided to take this or the the low the mid whatever silhouette and use that as a new canvas so the jordan one has kind of gone by the way and now everyone's taking the lower version of this shoe and making it it feels like they should have probably done another model or maybe designed one from the ground up so as much as i would say as much as i was the kind of person that would say hey why don't these brands go back into the archives and take models that aren't necessarily that well known and kind of breathe new life into them i'm also of the ilk that if you do have the manufacturing processes and manufacturing um, facilities and resources of a new balance why not just make something from the ground up that people are gonna love that can really tell your story as opposed to only going back into the archives but again considering you know his background considering the the taste levels and considering the appetite for this sort of stuff it makes complete sense as a home run and if you're just newly appointed into that role you want to get a couple of wins underneath your belt before you start experimenting and going and building new stuff from the ground up i completely get it but personally for me i'm just a little bit tired of seeing this shape seeing these paneling seeing this suit like just seeing this and this kind of logo i just don't know because i've seen this so often now and again that gr killed it i get why brands do it you do a collaboration obviously for the sake of trying to get the customer base to buy a shoe that they don't necessarily want to buy right or they don't know they want in a certain theory you slap a cool name next to it, a cool brand and hopefully that might add to the allure and then over time um, people might like the shoe itself and then you put out the gr and then that might then permeate into general consensus and the normies right because in the day the real money isn't really in sneakerheads like me you and i the real money is in trying to get regular people to buy those shoes as well because they're going to keep buying them again and again all over the world but again just in terms of visual fatigue i've seen this shape too much i'm fed up i don't want to see any more i want to see some new stuff but again i know it's a new job you got to do what you got to do to make sure people think that you're you know smashing it and whatnot but yeah i'm a bit tired of it but hey um what does it say remastered oh it's remastered i don't know what that means they add better materials i'm not too sure i'm not familiar with what the the og actually looked like but the details say here um the ald 
a New Balance 650R remaster for spring 2020. So this is obviously a collaboration. I think yeah, you can see on the tongue here, the Emilio and Dior, um sort of emblem here. I think it says, did it say it there? I'm not, not too sure, but regardless, this is definitely going to end up being a GR um, very, very soon. So you probably don't need to even bother trying to get a pair yourself now. Just wait for the GR to drop. But then I'm assuming the better colorways and more tasteful materials will definitely be used in this collaboration. So do as you please. Do as you please next on the list what do we have here oh yeah this is a, this is a kind of an interesting observation just from my point of view so i was perusing on the instagram and i saw that lucas about the model and actor um did a recent art show um this is here on the screen it says howdy i'm really excited to showing some of my first works at the offsite studio media alongside some of my favorite artists book an appointment blah 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 and he's obviously showing the works that he's showing which is essentially an upside down chair it looks like or a chair that's been put um a, a table that's been turned upside down the chair has been placed inside it that's basically um one of his interactive uh live pieces of work that he's hosting in the gallery and it made me think the and it made me think about kind of the pressure that's put on specifically black creatives it feels like which is again i'm not that kind of guy to be like a black and white thing but it's annoying that you have to be super amazing and great and and talented and out of this world at what you do in the arts or in the creative field when you're black but then the non-black people can basically get away with being completely mediocre and just kind of skating by doing the bare minimum because it feels like of course lucas what i'm gonna say 23 24 i'm not too sure how old he is maybe right he's approaching that kind of age so the kind of um, novelty of him being a young hot and pause guy is obviously gone um there's obviously new people that are coming up in the scene behind him who are 18 19 that people are featuring more so now he might be himself tired and kind of exhausted of being the model anyway because i'd imagine that kind of schedule of you know turning up to places being prodded and made to walk in you know in, in weird clothes and uncomfortable situations can get tiring really quickly especially if you didn't actually come into the scene wanting to be that person it's obviously a good opportunity to get a lot of money in a short period of time doing basically nothing but over time if you want if your aspirations are a bit grander right for yourself and you see yourself more as a creative overall it can be a bit exhausting to be tied towards that model label and you don't want to being a model i'd imagine it's sort of like being typecast in a tv series or a movie you don't want to keep doing the same role all the time because people aren't going to be open to seeing you doing other roles so imagine the modeling thing if you do it too long people won't really be receptive if you start djing or if you start finally writing non-fiction or being a public speaker or whatever it may be right if people are going to view it a little bit deeper but it just annoying that he has to kind of pivot so hard into a space like art contemporary art for instance he has to try and prove himself in this field you know he's going to get criticized and you know and people are going to point out that he looks lame and it's like an inspiration and what is this blah, blah, blah. but he's going to, have to learn in real time he's going to get a lot of pelters thrown at him just because he's trying to pivot away from being the cute kid that models into maybe being a full-time serious quote-unquote artist and you know for the most part people his friends it looks like on the comments seem to be liking what he's doing but i'd imagine a lot of people inside the actual art world itself will be looking at him like a bit of a poser that he's just pulling up on you because he's kind of realized that his time as a model is maybe gone but again i just it's just annoying i think for myself as a fellow black male to see somebody like him having to do so much in order to prove your worth sort of thing right he can't just be mediocre and turn up and just do whatever right and just throw a couple of shitty pictures that he took on his phone up on the gallery wall and have people pay he has to go above and beyond to prove himself in the field and it's just annoying it really really is because if we look at that there is not much difference between what he did there if you're criticizing what he did with you know a very quote-unquote serious artist and david lynch who's part of the if i'm not mistaken Stillhouse group right with jack gray and all those kind of good dudes right so a very prominent and influential contemporary artist and he did this piece here called um the weight of an elephant which if you're not w watching this is basically a foldable chair that's been bent with a ball it looks like so basically the ball's been made to look like it bent the chair and it's been placed in the corner of a gallery and you know it's a pretty serious piece of artwork i'm sure there's many editorial pieces and reviews written about it and he's been you know heralded bloody blah 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 and of course still house group is a fairly well respected art collective in general but there's not much difference between that and what lucas about done right but for sure people are going to have a lot more words to say about what he did because his face doesn't fit right or where he's from doesn't fit or maybe because of the fashion background whatever it may be it's just a little bit annoying and then another example 
is this um a robotic self healing chair that was featured when was this 2007 right 2007 which is a pretty it's a pretty novel and creative idea but again there's not much to this um that you would think that would kind of separate it from what luca has done i'm going to play this now for you let's get up on you on the screen and let's play this video so this is a, a chair that basically um heals itself right it kind of looks broken and then kind of heals itself at the flick of a switch That's it broken on stage <laughs> at an event called ID City 06. And then little by little, it puts itself together. Pretty cool. Okay, standing up now. Done. But anyway, that's it basically. Um, but yeah, good luck to Luca. Hopefully, um, it works out for him. This um new pivot into art. And hopefully he gets an opportunity to just prove himself, you know, like everybody else. Get kids in a fair crack of the whip instead of being, you know, um, judged in an unfair crack, in an unfair way based on his background, where he's from, whatnot, etc., etc. I would just prefer it if we were allowed to be mediocre much more than others. We have to kind of go above and beyond to prove our worth. But again, you know, I'm sure he's, he'll be okay. He's got all the resources and connections needed in order to be... Um, successful and I'm sure if I'm not mistaken from that interview did with Kerwin I think his dad's an artist or something like that so I'm sure he's going to be pointed in the right direction in terms of pro pro um, progressing and perfecting his practice over time so no harm in that one but definitely something to keep an eye on something to keep an eye on what else I think that might be it are we now in already because I'm fucking sweating my ass off here 55 minutes oh Bambarati, let's actually get, let's go here, let's put this over there. Let's not move there too much. What else we got? Boom, 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 boom. Let's move this over here. What else? Bash, bash, bosh. Bish, bash, bosh. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go this one. Let's do this. Yeah, let's do this. And down here. So, this is some news courtesy of Variety. Charlemagne the God heads to Cent Comedy Central for weekly late night show. So for sure, wherever Joe Rogan is, Joe Rogan, sorry, wherever Joe Budden is, he's probably spitting feathers, punching the wall. Because every, at every opportunity, at every occasion, when it comes to dealing with big corporations and productions and is it production companies or entertainment groups, whatever it may be, Charlemagne seems to have an ability to play nice despite having a far more checkered past than Joe Budden does. 
was it far more what do you say would how do you compare them in terms of having scandals and you know controversies and flashpoints in their career would you say they're about the same because if you think about it for a radio host somebody that doesn't make music somebody that just talks about stuff that's happening in culture retirement has got himself in a lot of skirmishes right and he's been able to somehow still despite all that play nice when it comes to getting on the big boy table and talking to these big um you know platforms and whatnot for certain enough comedy central isn't what it used to be but still he seems to be able to play that game far better than what joe budden's done and from so you know from the little experience that we know or knowledge that we have at the moment he seems to not be able to play nice when it comes to dealing with some of these big corporations so i wonder if he's looking at this sort of stuff more so in a way of like oh he's just lucky because he's just lucky or if he's looking at it more as a way of like oh this is a clear indication that i need to change my approach in business or if he just doesn't give a shit i don't really know but anyway let's read the news regardless it says here radio personality show me the god has built an audience of more than 4.5 million listeners a week for his provocative observational uh, observations sorry on daily headlines politics and trends and pop culture now the author podcast and co-host of a syndicated radio morning show the breakfast club is stepping up into the new microphone on comedy central um the viacom cbs channel has given a serious order of Charlemagne the god's honest truth with leonard um Charme charlemagne mckelvey that's interesting isn't it that he put his name there i wonder if that's a purpose pivot that he's doing now in order to kind of have two personas so he's not just tied permanently to the breakfast club because obviously charlemagne the god is mostly known from the breakfast club so it's an interesting way to introduce him as leonard mckelvey going forward right so people can you know this delineate between the two personas i'm assuming the weekly half hour show to premiere september 17th wow it's coming up very quickly promises to revolve around Charlemagne's culturally fluent take on social issues and also feature sketches interviews and social experiments so maybe it's going to be as similar to what um Jesus and Mira are doing with showtime right those kind of shows where he talks about um cultural event topics flashpoints and then is able to do some skits in between and whatnot sounds like a fun show the god's honest truth hails from mt TV Entertainment Studios, Rachel Edwards, Nick Cannon presents Wild and Now is showrunner, awesome tie in there, Stephen Cobber and Chris Leach of CBS the, the Morning Show and Aaron Magruder and Karen Kenny, James Dixon and Norman Alladajum are also executive producers. So he's got a lot of people involved in it. Charlemagne a, a, aka Leonard McCalvey. Again, they're doing that Leonard McCalvey thing, so it's definitely a pivot away from that. Have short lived roles on talk show comedy shows on MTV and MTV two a decade ago, which allowed him to build a relationship with Chris McCarthy, the longtime MTV executive who now oversees Comedy Center and other Viacom brands as president. Relationships, man. That's one thing Joe Biden doesn't do, in it? He doesn't cultivate relationships. And I think for us as fans, we have to be fair that is part of what kind of enamored us to the Joe Biden personality before we found out he also scumbags his friends because I think we were all okay with him kind of being a dick to corporations because they're faceless but in the moment it sort of affected his friends who we think are they're kind of like by by virtue they sort of feel like they're, like they're our friends too right in Rory and Ma that's when we all as Joe Biden podcast fans decided to jump ship and kind of give Joe Biden the finger on our way out but that's one thing that he's definitely not good at relationships in his personal life when it comes to you know dealing with his exes and baby mothers hasn't necessarily been the greatest thing we've obviously seen that publicized on tv and then of course relationship in business because he feels like he doesn't really have anyone rooting for him right that's the, obviously with the facebook deal that was one great thing he did and of course the patient thing for himself was obviously a good thing that he did as well but other than that it doesn't feel like he has people in the mainstream who are really trying to fight for him to get him on these platforms because his voice is necessary it seems like he's tolerated more so but maybe that's just my interpretation it says here this is one of those moments where i can show you better than i can tell you shall i mean said on the, the truth on his truth this is the first oh, i love that phrase isn't it he's gonna do that a lot isn't he remind people this is the third talk show chris mccarthy has done with me and those shows prepare me of this opportunity my south central brethren stephen colbert is the ultimate co-sign in a late night space and he wouldn't co-sign no bullshit we're going to win an emmy next year for best lightning direction i can feel <laughs> that's good that's funny um the emmy he'll probably end up getting because of representation they're gonna want to make sure that the appointment of him and the green line of this show is somewhat kind of validated but you would hope i would hope 
that he would try to just make a good show that people give a shit about right people that want to tune into don't try and court the approval of the industry i think if he's able to get the people on board that'll be fine but also maybe he's probably right in thinking the industry is where he needs to kind of put his attention because he's always going to have the streets with the breakfast club maybe pivoting away and trying to gain the attention and the love of the normies is probably a better way to go about things Charmin has made a career of his contrary reputation calling himself at various times the prince of pissing people off the ruler rubbing you the wrong way and the architect of aggravation in his Charlemagne the good persona McKelvey has been see persona they're definitely pivoting away from this because part of me also thinks if he's as as we've always seen right um it seems like whatever as more opportunity you get they then start to turn into what um elon musk called attack vectors and obviously over time whenever Charlemagne has got some good news in terms of his production was that podcasting network and other things that he's had um quite soon after has always followed the resurfacing of all those cancellation topics when it comes to the alleged rape and all that sort of stuff and obviously got kwame brown who's permanently got his foot on Charlemagne the god's neck so it wouldn't surprise me off the back of this news if somehow in a couple of weeks time those same articles and people and whatnot kind of rear their heads again and then we go for the same cycle so i'm wondering if you're see Viacom CBS, have you already gone through and done your due diligence into all the who you sign and you're at the point where you think it doesn't matter what they say, we're going to stick by this guy? Or will they do what most of these networks do whenever an allegation that's already been spoken about prior comes up again, but it happens to catch the public's attention? Because that's a thing that I think black people don't really kind of... Um, they kind of t not take for granted but the people don't really acknowledge too tough because you know it is what it is for the most part people in hip-hop don't really get cancelled right they only get cancelled when it feels like the general population the normies decide to get outraged so if they're able to regurgitate some of these cancellation topics again into the news cycle and somehow grab the attention of people who just watch cbs regularly then that might be the kind of hammer that comes down and kind of kaputs this whole show i hope it doesn't happen of course for him because you know you want him to do his show but it does seem to be a fairly routine cycle people go through right somebody gets some good news they're slightly controversial they start to controversial takes from the past to kind of get resurfaced and then people start to call for them to get cancelled not people you know there's usually less than 10 of them but regardless they seem to be really loud seem to be really consistent and you know in Kwame Brown you've got somebody that's incredibly charismatic and funny that's doing it so that generally generally doesn't help his case either and you know but Sharmi's done well though he hasn't engaged Kwame at all when it comes to that rape allegation stuff he's mostly when it comes to directly apologizing for the fact that he brought up his family's sketchy past but he hasn't really engaged that bit which is fair because you know you don't really want to go down that route because if you do I'm sure more skeletons will come out of the closet it says he had a breakfast club radio program that originates from New York Power 105 station and he co-hosts with DJ Envy and Angela Yee. Marked his 10-year anniversary last year, Charlemagne signed a lucrative pact with distributor iHeartMedia that called for him to launch a Black Effect podcast network and served as the company's senior creative officer of culture and content programming. It's interesting, he left, or he hasn't left, he's doing this show, might mean there's going to leave after, but I think he'd re-signed a new contract, I'm, I'm pretty much sure. The other guy that with a beard that sits behind Envy, he left too. He was crying and complaining about not getting more airtime but then he ended up getting a pretty decent deal if you listen to what he said on youtube again don't know if he's telling the truth and then it's even that shot i mean went on his show and then basically said people don't play their position too much so i don't know if this is tied into it no idea um, he's got best-selling books says here Charmaine knows exactly what he wants to do with this show which is a smack the audience upside the head every week and make sure they're paying attention to the world around them said Magruder creator and producer of the Bond Docs franchise he is keenly aware of the power of his voice and always looking to use it to maximize effect to maximum effect sorry which requires both talent and courage Charmaine became the sensation in the 1990s in South Carolina he worked with Wendy Williams blah, 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 blah. Uh, but over the past decade he came into his own his own his audio era the daily radio sport and popular podcast the brilliant idiots Oh, nice little mention there helped establish Charlemagne as a cultural gatekeeper for the hip hop community he has made nine appearances of the guests on the collate show which helped spark the partnership with Comedy Central series oh interesting Comedy Central has been on the wane a little bit isn't it? I think some of their web stuff and TV stuff has probably been suffering so we need to see how that revamp goes because it did fire a bunch of people as well if I'm not mistaken the two share a common trait in being natives of Palmetto State the man grew up as Larry Kelvey um, has been vocal of his work about the formative experience of his native monks so what 
Stephen Colbert's name is actually Larry Mc. Oh, sorry, if I say this, that's not that's what I mean. For long, the long time, Monk's Corner, South Carolina has been unrepresented late night show. Said Colbert, I look forward to. Oh, sorry, uh, the snow. No one looked up. I look forward to always in which uh, in all ways in which with fearless, peerless Charlemagne is going to change the game. The pact of Charlemagne also brings Colbert back to Comedy Central, the outlet where he got his break. Uh, the the Charlemagne's thought provoking and habited observations both get under people's skin open their minds. Okay, let's see, man. Right, Charlemagne is represented by ICM KK KK Entertainment. Oh, one more K and it gets sketchy. And Del Shaw. So yeah, good luck to him. Again, another indication of just how maybe playing the game and being media or being kind of network friendly can really help your career because all these opportunities are less so about him and more so about the ability to maybe get that face in, in, on TV to then allow other faces to sit alongside him. That's more what you need really when it comes to representation. And it's good as well because you actually got somebody that's actually talented. It's not just one of those affirmative action sort of stuff. It's actually somebody that's just good at what they do and they can obviously bring other talented people who are also from unrepresented community but are fundamentally good at what they do. They just need a chance and then slowly but surely the TV landscape will change for the better going forward. That's all you can hope for. Anyway, that's your excellent show episode number 478. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time tuning in and watching the show via the YouTube, make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, a share and a little five star review will help the show go a long way. And of course, I've got a Patreon too, so get involved there. Show notes are in the description or well, Patreon links in the description. Click on that, get involved. Bonus shows coming out this weekend. Don't delay. And I'll see you soon. Peace.